Can any of you amuse me? Have you any stories or any news? For Tata Tita. Oh, for Tata Tita, for Tata Tita. Always for Tata Tita. Some new tale to set me against her, huh? No. This time, Fatata Tita has been virtuous. <laughs> Fatinus has been trying to bribe her to let him speak with you. Ah, you all sell audiences with me as if I saw whom you please and not whom I please. <laughs> you laugh, but take care. Take care. I will find out someday how to make myself served as Caesar is served. Old hook nose. <laughs> Silence, Charmian. Do not you be a silly little Egyptian fool. Do you know why I allow you all to chatter impertinently just as you please, instead of treating you as Fatata Tita would treat you if she were queen? Because you try to imitate Caesar in everything, and he lets everybody say what they please to him. No, but because I asked him one day why he did so. And he said, let your women talk and you will learn something from them. What have I to learn from them, I said. What they are said he, and oh, you should have seen his eye as he said it. You would have curled up your shallow things. <laughs> at whom are you laughing, at me or at Caesar? Oh, uh, uh, at Caesar. If you were not a fool, you would laugh at me, and if you were not a coward, you would not be afraid to tell me so. Father Tita, they tell me that Pothinus has offered you a bribe to admit him to my presence. No, by my father's God. Have I not told you not to deny things? Go, take the bribe and bring in Pothinus. Don't answer me, go! Oh, I wish Caesar were back in Rome. It will be a bad day for you all when he goes. Oh, if I were not ashamed to let him see that I'm as cruel at heart as my father, I would make you repent that speech. Why do you wish him away? He makes you so terribly prosy and serious and learned and philosophical. It's worse than being religious at our ages. <laughs> Cease with that endless cackling, will you? Hold your tongues. Well, well, we must try to live up to Caesar. <laughs> the finest phase here. There, there, that will do. Let him come in. Well, Pothinus, what is the latest news from your rebel friends? I am no friend of rebellion, and a prisoner does not receive news. Uh, you are no more a prisoner than I am, than Caesar is. These six months we've been besieged in this palace by my subject. You are allowed to walk on the beach among the soldiers. Can I go further myself, or can Caesar? You are but a child, Cleopatra, and do not understand these matters. <laughs> <laughs> I see you do not know the latest news, Pothinus. What is that? That Cleopatra is no longer a child. Shall I tell you how to grow much older and much, much wiser in one day? I should prefer to grow wiser without growing older. Well. Go up to the top of the lighthouse and get somebody to take you by the hair and throw you into the sea. <laughs> she is right, the finest. You will come to the shore with much conceit washed out. <laughs> Be gone, all of you. I will speak with the finest alone. Drive them out, Patata Tita. <laughs> now, for finest, why did you bribe Patata Tita to bring you hither? Cleopatra. What they tell me is true, you are changed. Do you speak with Caesar every day for six months, and you will be changed? It is the common talk that you are infatuated with this old man. Infatuated? What does that mean? Made foolish, is it not? Oh, no. I wish I were. You wish you were made foolish? How so? When I was foolish, I did what I liked, except when Fatata Tita beat me, and even then I cheated her and did it by stealth. Now that Caesar has made me wise, it is no use my liking or disliking. I do what must be done and have no time to attend to myself. That is not happiness, but it is greatness. If Caesar were gone, I think I could govern the Egyptians. For what Caesar is to me, I am to the fools around me. Cleopatra, this may be the vanity of you. Oh, no, it is not that I am so clever, but that the others are so stupid. Truly, that is the great secret. Well, now tell me what you came to say. I? Nothing. Nothing? At least, to beg for my liberty, that is all. For that you would have knelt to Caesar. No, Pothinus, you came with some plan that depended on Cleopatra being a little nursery kitten. Now that Cleopatra is a queen, the plan is upset. It is so. <laughs> Is Cleopatra then indeed a queen, and no longer Caesar's prisoner and slave? 
But thine us, we are all Caesar's slaves, all we in this land of Egypt, whether we will or no. And she who is wise enough to know this will reign when Caesar departs. You harp on Caesar's departure. What if I do? Does he not love you? Love me? For thine us, Caesar loves no one. Who are those we love, only those whom we do not hate? All people are strangers and enemies to us except those we love. But it is not so with Caesar. He has no hatred in him. He makes friends with everyone as he does with dogs and children. His kindness to me is a wonder. Neither mother, father, nor nurse have ever taken so much care for me or thrown open their thoughts to me so freely. Well, is not this love? What, when he will do as much for the first girl he meets on his way back to Rome? His kindness is not for anything in me. It is in his own nature. But how can you be sure that he does not love you as men love women? Because I cannot make him jealous. I have tried. Ah, perhaps I should have asked then, do you love him? Can one love a god? Besides, I love another Roman, one whom I saw long before Caesar, no god but a man, one who can love and hate, one whom I can hurt and would hurt me. Does Caesar know this? Yes. And he is not angry? He promises to send him to Egypt to please me. I do not understand this man. You understand Caesar. How could you? I do, by instinct. Your Majesty caused me to be admitted today. What message has the Queen for me? This. You think that by making my brother king, you will rule in Egypt because you are his guardian and he is a little silly. The Queen is pleased to say so. The Queen is pleased to say this also, that Caesar will eat up you and Achilles and my brother as a cat eats up mice and that he will put on this land of Egypt as a shepherd puts on his garment. And when he has done that, he will return to Rome and leave Cleopatra here as his viceroy. That he shall never do. We have a thousand men to his ten, and we shall drive him and his beggarly legions into the sea. You rant like any common fellow. Go then and marshal your thousands and make haste. For Mithridates of Pergamos is at hand with reinforcements for Caesar. Caesar has held you at bay with two legions. We shall see what he will do with twenty. Cleopatra! Enough! Enough! Caesar has spoiled me for talking to weak things like you. <laughs> Let me go forth from this hateful place. What angers you? The curse of all the gods of Egypt be upon her. She has sold her country to the Roman that she may buy it back from him with her kisses. Fool! Did she not tell you that she would have Caesar gone? You listened. I took care that some honest woman should be at hand whilst you were with her. Now, by the gods... Enough of your gods. It is no use you coming to Cleopatra. You are only an Egyptian. She will not listen to any of her own race. She treats us all as children. May she perish for it. May your tongue wither for that wish. Go, send for Lucius Septimius, the slayer of Pompey. He is a Roman. Maybe she will listen to him. Be gone. I know to whom I must go now. To whom, then? To a greater Roman than Lucius. And mark this, mistress. You thought before Caesar came that Egypt should presently be ruled by you and your crew in the name of Cleopatra. I set myself against it. Aye, that it might be ruled by you and your crew in the name of Ptolemy. Better me or even you than a woman with a Roman heart. And that is what Cleopatra is now become. Whilst I live, she shall never rule. So guide yourself accordingly. The Roman commander will await Caesar here. Oh, hello, Sir Klein. How high have we come? We are on the palace roof, O oh, beloved of victory. Oh, good. The beloved of victory has no more stairs to get up. Caesar approaches. I roof you. A new baldric, a new golden pummel to your sword. And you've had your hair cut. But not your beard, impossible. Oh, yes, perfumed by Jupiter Olympus. Well, is it to please myself? No, my son, Rufio, but to please me. 
to celebrate my birthday. Your birthday? You always have a birthday when there's a pretty girl to be flattered, or an ambassador to be conciliated. We had seven of him in ten months last year. It is true, Rufio. I shall never break myself of these petty deceits. Who's to dine with us besides Cleopatra? Apollodorus, the Sicilian. Oh, that popinjay. Oh, come. Apollodorus is good company, Rufio. Good company. Oh, he can swim a bit and fence a bit. He might be worse if only he knew how to hold his tongue. Well, the gods forbid he should ever learn. Uh, give me a good talker, one with wit and imagination enough to live without continually doing something. Caesar, have you noticed that I'm before my time? Uh, I thought that meant something. What is it? Pathinus wants to speak to you. I advise you to see him. There's some plotting going on here among the women. Who is Pathinus? A fellow with hair like squirrels, fellow. The little king's bear leader, whom you kept prisoner. And has he not escaped? No. Why not? Have I not told you always to let prisoners escape unless there are special orders to the contrary? He won't escape. He prefers to stay and spy on us. And so would I if I had to do with generals subject to fits of clemency. Mm, and so he wants to see me. I, I brought him with me. He's waiting there under guard. Well, well, let us have him. Who oh, there, guard? Release your man and send him up. Come along. Ah, Pothinus. You are welcome. What is the news this afternoon? Caesar, I come to warn you of a danger and to make you an offer. Never mind the danger. Make the offer. Never mind the offer. What's the danger? Caesar, you think that Cleopatra is devoted to you. My friend, I already know what I think. Come to your offer. Spit it out, man. What have you to say? I have to say that you have a traitress in your camp, Cleopatra. The queen! Oh, you should have spat it out sooner, you fool. Now it's too late. What is he doing here? Just going to tell me something about you. You shall hear it. Proceed, Pothinus. Caesar, I... Well, out with it. What I have to say is for your ear, not for the Queen's. There are means of making you speak. Take care. Caesar does not employ those means. My friend... When a man has anything to tell in this world, the difficulty is not to make him tell it, but to prevent him from telling it too often. Let me celebrate my birthday by setting you free. Ah, well, we shall not meet again. Caesar, this mercy is foolish. Will you not give me a private audience? Your life may depend upon it. Yes, now we shall have some heroics. Porthinus. Caesar, the dinner will spoil if you begin preaching your favorite sermon about life and death. Peace, Rufio. I desire to hear Caesar. Your majesty's heard it before. You repeated it to Apollodorus last week, and he thought it was all your own. <laughs> oh, there, guard. Pass the prisoner out. He's released. Now, off with you. You've lost your chance. I will speak. You see? Torture would not have wrung a word from him. Caesar. You have taught Cleopatra the arts by which the Romans govern the world. At last, they cannot even govern themselves. What then? What then? Are you so besotted with her beauty that you do not see that she is impatient to reign in Egypt alone, and that her heart is set on your departure? Liar! What? Protestations? Contradictions? No. I do not deign to contradict. Let him talk. From her own lips I have heard it. You are to be her cat's paw. You are to tear the crown from her brother's head and set it on her own, delivering us all into her hand. Delivering yourself also. And then Caesar can return to Rome. Or depart through the gate of death, which is nearer and surer. Well, my friend, and is not this very natural? Natural? Then you do not resent treachery. Resent? Thou foolish Egyptian, what have I to do with resentment? Do I resent the wind when it chills me, or the night when it makes me stumble in the darkness? Shall I resent youth when it turns from age, and ambition when it turns from servitude? <laughs> to tell me such a story as this is but to tell me that the sun will rise tomorrow. But it is false, false, I swear it! It is true, though you swore it a thousand times, and believed all you swore. Come, Rufio. Let us see Pothinus pass the guard. I have a word to say to him. We must give the queen a moment to recover herself. Tell your friends, Pothinus, they must not think that I am opposed to a reasonable settlement of the country's affairs. Dada Tita, Dada Tita. Peace, peace, child. Be comforted. Can they hear us? No, dear heart, no. 
Listen to me. If he leaves the palace alive, never see my face again. He will first strike his life out as I strike his name from your lips. Dash him down from the wall. Break him on the stones. Kill, kill, kill him. The dog shall perish. Fail in this, and you go out from before me forever. So be it. You shall not see my face until his eyes are darkened. Come soon. Soon. <laughs> So you've come back to me, Caesar. I thought you were angry. Welcome, Apollodorus. Cleopatra grows more womanly, beautiful from week to week. Truth, Apollodorus? Far, far short of the truth. Friend Rufio threw a pearl into the sea. Caesar fished up a diamond. Caesar fished up a touch of rheumatism, my friend. Come. To dinner, to dinner. Yes, to dinner. I have ordered such a dinner for you, Caesar. Aye, what are we to have? <laughs> Peacock's brains. Peacock's brains, Apollodorus. <laughs> Not for me. I prefer nightingales, <laughs> Roast boar, Rufio. Ah, good. What shall we serve to whet Caesar's appetite? Uh, what have you got? Sea hedgehogs, black and white sea acorns, sea nettles, becaficos, purple shellfish. Any oysters? Assuredly. British oysters? British oysters, Caesar. Oysters, then. Caesar will deign to choose his wine, a Sicilian, lesbian, Keon. Or Greek. Who would drink Roman wine when he could get Greek? Try the lesbian, Caesar. Bring me my barley water. Bring me my Falernium. It is a waste of time giving you dinner, Caesar. My scullions would not condescend to your diet. Well, well, let us try the lesbian. But when I return to Rome, I will make laws against these extravagances. I will even get the laws carried out. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Today you want to be like other people. Idle, luxurious, and kind. Well, for once, I will sacrifice my comfort. There. Now are you satisfied? And you no longer believe that I long for your departure for Rome. I no longer believe anything. My brains are asleep. Besides, who knows whether I shall return to Rome? Oh, what? What has Rome to show me that I have not seen already? One year of Rome is like another, except that I grow older, whilst the crowd in the Appian Way is always the same age. It is no better here in Egypt. The old men, when they are tired of life, say, we have seen everything except the source of the Nile. And why not see that? Cleopatra, will you come with me and track the flood to its cradle in the heart of the regions of mystery? Shall we leave Rome behind us? Rome that has achieved greatness only to learn how greatness destroys nations of men who are not great. Shall I make you a new kingdom and build you a holy city there in the great unknown? Yes, yes, you shall. I know we will conquer Africa with two legions before we come to the roast ball. Come, no scoffing. This is a noble scheme. In it, Caesar is no longer merely the conquering soldier, but the creative poet artist. Let us name the holy city and consecrate it with lesbian wine. Cleopatra shall name it herself. It shall be called Caesar's gift to his beloved. No, no, something vaster than that, something universal, like the starry firmament. Why not simply the cradle of the Nile? No, the Nile is my ancestor and he is a god. Oh, I have thought of something. The Nile shall name it himself. Let us call on the Nile altogether. You must say with me, send us thy voice, Father Nile. Send, send us, us thy, thy voice, voice, Father, Father Nile. Nile. Ah! What was that? Nothing, they're beating some slave. Nothing? A man with a knife in him, I'll swear. A murder. Shh. Silence. Did you hear that? Another cry? Oh, a third. Something fell on the beach, I think. Something with bones in it. Eh? Shh, hush, Rufio. Will you leave me, Caesar? Apollodorus, I am going. Faith, dearest queen, my appetite is gone. Go down to the courtyard, Apollodorus. Find out what has happened. Your soldiers have killed somebody, perhaps. What does it matter? Rufio, this must be seen to. Caesar. Queen looks again on the face of her servant. There's some mischief between those two. <gasps> Cleopatra, what has happened? Nothing. 
Dearest Caesar, nothing. I am innocent. Oh, dear Caesar, are you angry with me? Why do you look at me so? I've been here with you all the time. How can I know what has happened? That is true. Of course it is true. You know it is true, Rufio. Well, I shall know presently. Now, mistress, I shall want you. My place is with the queen. She has done no harm, Rufio. Let her stay. Very well, then my place is here too. Rufio, there is a time for obedience. And there's a time for obstinacy. Cleopatra, send her away. Yes, I will. I will do whatever you ask me, Caesar, always because I love you. But Dr. Tita, go away. The queen's word is my will. I shall be at hand for the queen's call. And remember, Caesar, your bodyguard also is within call. Why do you allow Rufio to treat you so? You should teach him his place. Teach him to be my enemy, to hide his thoughts from me, as you are now hiding yours. Why do you say that, Caesar? Indeed, indeed, I'm not hiding anything. You're wrong to treat me like this. I'm only a child, and you turn into stone because you think someone has been killed. I cannot bear it. <laughs> There. I know you hate tears. You shall not be troubled with them. Oh, I know you are not angry, but only sad. Only, I'm so silly. I cannot help being hurt when you speak coldly. Of course, you're quite right. It's dreadful to think of anyone being killed or even hurt, and I hope that nothing really serious has... What has frightened you into this? What have you done? Aha! Uh -huh. That sounds like the answer. I have not betrayed you, Caesar. I swear it. I know that. I have not trusted you. Again, Pompey's murderer. The town has gone mad, I think. They were tearing the palace down and driving us into the sea straight away. We laid hold of this renegade in clearing them out of the courtyard. Release him. What has offended the citizens, Lucius Septibius? What did you expect, Caesar? Pothinus was a favorite of theirs. What has happened to Pothinus? I set him free, here, not half an hour ago. Did they not pass him out? Aye, through the gallery arch 60 feet above ground, with three inches of steel in his ribs. He is as dead as Pompey. We are quits now as to killing, you and I. Assassinated. Our prisoner. Our guest. Rufio. Whoever did it was a wise man and a friend of yours. But none of us had a hand in it, so it's no use to frown at me. He was slain by order of the Queen of Egypt. I am not Julius Caesar, the dreamer who allows every slave to insult him. Rufio has said I did well. Now the others shall judge me too. This Pothinus sought to make me conspire with him to betray Caesar to Achilles and Ptolemy. I refused, and he cursed me and came privily to Caesar to accuse me of his own treachery. I caught him in the act, and he insulted me. Me, the queen, to my face. Caesar would not avenge me. He spoke him fair and set him free. Was I right to avenge myself? Speak, Lucius. I do not gainsay it, but you get little thanks from Caesar for it. Speak, Apollodorus. Was I wrong? I have only one word of blame, most beautiful. You should have called upon me, your knight. And in fair duel, I should have slain this man. I will be judged by your very slave, Caesar. Britannus, speak. Was I wrong? Were treachery, falsehood, and disloyalty left unpunished? Society must become like an arena full of wild beasts tearing one another to pieces. Caesar is in the wrong. And so, the verdict is against me, it seems. Listen to me, Caesar. If one man in all Alexandria can be found to say that I did wrong, I swear to have myself crucified on the door of the palace by my own slave. If one man in all the world can be found, now or forever, to know that you did wrong, that man will have either to conquer the world as I have or be crucified by it. Do you hear? These knockers at your gate are also believers in vengeance and in stabbing. You have slain their leader. It is right that they shall slay you. If you doubt it, ask your four counsellors here. And then in the name of that right, shall I not slay them for murdering their queen and be slain in my turn by their countrymen as the invader of their fatherland? Can Rome do less than slay these slayers too to show the world how Rome avenges her sons and her honour? And so, to the end of history, 
Murder shall breed murder. Always in the name of right and honor and peace. Until the gods are tired of blood. Create a race that can understand. Hearken you who must not be insulted. Go near enough to catch their words. You will find them bitterer than the tongue of Pothinus. Let the Queen of Egypt now give her orders for vengeance and take her measures for defense, for she has renounced Caesar. You will not desert me, Caesar. You will defend the palace. You have taken the powers of life and death upon you. I am only a dreamer. But they will kill me. Then why not? In pity. Pity? What? Has it come to this so suddenly that nothing can save you now but pity? Did it save Pathinus? Caesar, enough of preaching. The enemy is at the gate. Aye, and what has held him baffled at the gate all these months? Was it my folly, as you deem it, or your wisdom? In this Egyptian red sea of blood, whose hand has held all your heads above the waves? And yet, when Caesar says to such an one, friend, go free, you clinging for your little life to my sword, dare steal out and stab him in the back. And you, soldiers and gentlemen and honest servants, as you forget that you are, applaud this assassination and say, Caesar is in the wrong. By the gods, I am tempted to open my hand and let you all sink into the flood. But Caesar? If you do, you will perish yourself. Now, my great Joe, you filthy little Egyptian rat. That's the very word to make him walk out alone into the city and leave us here to be cut to pieces. Will you desert us because we're a parcel of fools? I mean no harm by killing. I do it as a dog kills a cat by instinct. We're all dogs at your heels, but we've served you faithfully. Alas, with you, my son. As dogs, we are like to perish now in the streets. So Caesar despair. He who has never hoped can never despair. Caesar, in good or bad fortune, looks his fate in the face. Look it in the face, then, and it will smile as it always has on Caesar. Do you presume to encourage me? I offer you my services. I will change sides if you will have me. What? At this point? At this point. Do you suppose Caesar is mad to trust you? I do not ask him to trust me until he is victorious. I ask for my life and for a command in Caesar's army. And since Caesar is a fair dealer, I will pay in advance. Pay? How? With a piece of good news for you. What news? What news? What news did you say, my son Rufio? The relief has arrived. What other news remains for us? Is it not so, Lucius Septimius? Mithridates of Pergamus is on the march. He has taken Pelusium. Lucius Septimius, you are henceforth my officer. Rufio, the Egyptians must have sent every soldier from the city to prevent Mithridates crossing the Nile. There is nothing in the streets now but mob, mob. It is so. Mithridates is marching by the great road to Memphis to cross above the delta. Achilles will fight him there. Achilles shall fight Caesar there. Away, Britannus, see to my horse and armor. I will, Caesar. Away, Lucius, give the word. Caesar. Apollodorus, lend me your sword and your right arm for this campaign. I and my heart and life to move. Ha <laughs> ha, this is something my like business. Is it not, my only son? Caesar. Eh? Have you forgotten? Uh, I am busy now, my child, busy. When I return, your affairs shall be settled. Farewell, and be good and patient. That game is played and lost, Cleopatra. The woman always gets the worst of it. Go, follow your master. As a word first, tell your executioner that if Pathinus had been properly killed in the throat, he would not have called out. Your man bungled his work. How do you know it was a man? Well, it was not you. You were with us when it happened. with her own hand. Whoever it was, let my enemies beware of her. Look to it, Rufio. You who dare make the queen of Egypt a fool before Caesar. I will look to it, Cleopatra.
Dr. Tita. But Dr. Tita, it is dark and I am alone. Come to me. Hello? May I pass? Pass the ball to the Sicilian there. Is Caesar the can? Not yet. He's still in the marketplace. I could not stand any more of the roaring of the soldiers after half an hour of the enthusiasm of an army when he was in need of a little sea air. Any fresh news of the war, Polydorus? The little King Ptolemy was drowned. Drowned? Oh, yeah. With the rest of them, Caesar attacked them from three sides at once and swept them into the Nile. Ptolemy's barge sank. A oh, marvelous man, this Caesar. Will he come soon, think you? He was settling the Jewish question when I left. He has made short work of them. Here he comes. Hula! Caesar comes! Attention now! Caesar comes! I see my ship awaits me. The hour of Caesar's farewell to Egypt has arrived. And now, Rufio, what remains to be done before I go? You have not yet appointed a Roman governor for this province. What say you to Mithridates of Pergamos? my reliever and rescuer, the great son of you, Peto. Why, that you'll want him elsewhere. Do you forget that you have some three or four armies to conquer on your way home? Indeed. Well, what say you to yourself? I? I a governor? What are you dreaming of? Do you not know that I'm only the son of a freedman? Has not Caesar called you his son? Peace a while there! And hear me. Hear Caesar. Hear Caesar. Hear Caesar. Hear the service, quality, rank, and name of the Roman governor. By service, Caesar's shield. By quality, Caesar's friend. By rank, a Roman soldier. <laughs> By name, Rufio. <laughs> I, I am Caesar's shield. But of what use shall I be when I am no longer on Caesar's arm? Well, no matter. Where is that British islander of mine? Here, Caesar. Who bad you, pray, thrust yourself into the battle of the Delta, uttering the barbarous cries of your native land, and affirming yourself a match for any four of the Egyptians to whom you applied unseemly epithets? Caesar. I ask you to excuse the language that escaped me in the heat of the moment. And how did you, who cannot swim, cross the canal with us when we stormed the camp? Caesar, I clung to the tail of your horse. These are not the deeds of a slave, Britannicus, but of a free man. Caesar, I was born free. But they call you Caesar's slave. Only as Caesar's slave have I found real freedom. Well said. Ungrateful that I am, I was about to set you free. But now I will not part from you for a million talents. This Roman knows how to make men serve him. Aye. Men too humble to become dangerous rivals to him. Oh, subtle one. Oh, cynic. Apollodorus, I leave the art of Egypt in your charge. Remember, Rome loves art and will encourage it ungrudgingly. I understand, Caesar. Rome will produce no art itself, but it will buy up and take away whatever the other nations produce. What? Rome produce no art? Is peace not an art? Is war not an art? Is government not an art? Is civilization not an art? All these we give you in exchange for a few ornaments. You will have the best of the bargain. Now, what else have I to do before I embark? There's something I cannot remember. How can it be? Well, well, it must remain undone. We must not waste this favorable wind. Farewell, Rufio. Caesar, I'm loath to let you go to Rome without your shield. There are too many daggers there. It matters not. I shall finish my life's work on my way back. And then I shall have lived long enough. Besides, I've always disliked the idea of dying. I'd rather be killed. Farewell. Farewell. Farewell! 
and Apollodorus, and my friends, all of you, aboard. Has Cleopatra no part in this leave-taking? I knew there was something. How could you let me forget her, Rufio? Had I gone without seeing you, I should never have forgiven myself. Is this morning for me? No. Ah, uh, that was thoughtless of me. It's for your brother. No. For whom, then? Ask the Roman governor whom you have left us. Rufio? Yes, Rufio. He who is to rule here in Caesar's name, in Caesar's way, according to Caesar's boasted laws of life. He is to rule as he can, Cleopatra. He has taken the work upon him and will do it in his own way. Not in your way, then. What do you mean by my way? Without punishment, without revenge, without judgment. Ah, that is the right way, the great way, the only possible way in the end. Believe it, Rufio, if you can. I, I believe it, Caesar. You have convinced me of it long ago. But look, you, you are sailing for Numidia today. Now tell me, if you meet a hungry lion there, you will not punish it for wanting to eat you. No. Nor revenge upon it, the blood of those it has already eaten. No. Nor judge it for its guiltiness. No. What then will you do to save your life from it? Kill it, man, without malice, just as it would kill me. What does this parable of the lion mean? Why, Cleopatra had a tigress that killed men at her bidding. I thought she might bid it kill you someday. Well, had I not been Caesar's pupil, what pious things might I not have done to that tigress? I might have punished it. I might have revenged Pathinus on it. Pathinus? I might have judged it. But I put all these follies behind me and without malice only cut its throat. And that is why Cleopatra comes to you in mourning. He has shed the blood of my servant for Tata Tita. On your head be it as upon his Caesar if you hold him free of it. On my head be it then, for it was well done. Rufio, had you set yourself in the seat of the judge and with hateful ceremonies and appeals to the gods handed that woman over to some hired executioner to be slain before the people in the name of justice, never again would I have touched your hand without a shudder? This was natural slaying. I feel no horror at it. No, not when a Roman slays an Egyptian. All the world will now see how unjust and corrupt Caesar is. Come, do not be angry with me. I am sorry for that poor Tota Tita. <laughs> <laughs> you are laughing. Does that mean reconciliation? No, no, no. But it is so ridiculous to hear you call her Tota Tita. <laughs> what? As much a child as ever, Cleopatra. <laughs> Have I not made a woman of you after all? Oh, it is you who are a great baby. You make me seem silly because you will not behave seriously. But you have treated me badly, and I do not forgive you. Bid me farewell. I will not. I will send you a beautiful present from Rome. Beauty from Rome to Egypt, indeed. What can Rome give me that Egypt cannot give me? That is true, Caesar. If the present is to be really beautiful, I should have to buy it for you in Alexandria. You are forgetting the treasures for which Rome is most famous, my friend. You cannot buy them in Alexandria. What are they, Caesar? Her sons. Come, Cleopatra. Forgive me and bid me farewell. And I will send you a man, Roman from head to heel and Roman of the noblest, not old and ripe for the knife, not lean in the arms and cold in the heart, not hiding a bald head under his conqueror's laurels, not stooped with the weight of the world on his shoulders, but brisk and fresh, strong and young, hoping in the morning, fighting in the day and reveling in the evening. Will you take such an one in exchange for Caesar? His name, his name... Shall it be Mark Antony? Oh. You're a bad hand at a bargain, mistress, if you will swap Caesar for Antony. So now you are satisfied? You will not forget. I will not forget. Farewell, I do not think we shall meet again. Farewell. Hail Caesar! No tears, dearest queen. They stab your servant to the heart. He will return someday. Oh, I hope not. But I can't help crying all the same. 